Yeah. Where'd you go? Oh, there <laughs> what happened? <laughs> um, can everybody hear me? Is this all right? Yes. This yes, one? Um, thank you for having me. I'm sorry we couldn't work it out the first time, but I'm glad to finally be here. It's the first time I've ever read the Barnes and Noble, so I like this little spot. And thank you for talking about your magazine. Oh, I worked for Ninth Letter, which is a literary magazine in Illinois oh, for years and years. Yeah, and we we also had artists who would work directly with the writers, and it was amazing. So I love that you're that you're doing that. That's amazing. Um, I'd love to talk to you about it after <laughs> we're done. Definitely. Um, so hi everyone. I'm Matt. Um, I'm going to read just a little bit from both of these books and then a couple of poems from this new thing I'm working on, which uh, I was at the John Day Fossil Beds working on, actually. So, Translation, which is the first book. Um, Translation is an odd book. It, um, I studied classics when I was in college. Uh, I wanted to translate Greek and Latin. That was the thing that I really wanted to do. But then I realized, actually, I wanted to write poetry. Uh, and I didn't think of these things as connected in any way. Like, they just didn't seem connected to me. Um, but what I really wanted to write about was my family, because that's <coughs> what everybody writes about, I assume. Um, and I finally realized that the way to talk about my family was to talk about mythology and to talk about these classical figures. It was the only way I could really talk about my parents. It was the only way I could really talk about um, my mother leaving, um, the only way I could think about the dissolution of my family. So a lot of that comes from here. So if you know especially a lot from the Iliad, you're going to get a lot of this. If you don't necessarily, I'll try to give some preview in that. But I'm going to start with this poem called Epithet. When we say epithet in this context, we don't necessarily mean um, saying something terrible about someone, as we would in our sort of current context. but we mean a word that stands in for a person or a place um, in Greek. So, epithet. If you're Achilles, water is something you struggle with, whether tears or angry river. Your mother loves only the sea. Your mother is subordinate to the sea, but isn't everything? When you heard the news, when you saw how much of your friend they took. The tent was the first to go. Shatter this, rip that, throw what's left into the sea. A swatch of fabric for you, grandfather. Cover your white foam knuckles, keep fighting, bluff and shore like this one, or everything we've ruined comes back to us. All wheel and yoke, and wooden buckle, all bronze arrow and horsehair plume, our war machines, our fishing lures, the best parts of ourselves pocked with rust and half buried in the sand. Oh, thank you. Hawk. I like the hawk most when chased by smaller birds. The statement, the bullet, and the feathers. I assume another night will bring blood and eggs. Here, it's dusk over water, like any other dusk, except unbearable. I think that sadness has feathers, that the beauty in a bathing hawk is commiseration. Just how much of us is water or waterproof. And there's no judgment here. It's only physics that dictates that we're hungry. I love it when you blink in that small internal combustion engine sort of way. I turn what I can into energy, and the rest becomes memory. And this is where I've placed you. Such alchemy. Just as my mother turned my father into alcohol, hydrocarbons burn in their magnificent chain. The sky was purple last night, and you kept waking me up. You kept telling me that the world has feathers. Don't let it drop roll off. Don't let it spill. I can't be held responsible for such small fluctuations in the chemical structure of your world. Everything is flammable there. The moment 
before you have everything, you realize that you have nothing. And this feeling, like a small feathered bullet, can knock you from the sky. So this next poem, a lot of, like I said, a lot of these poems are about family. This next poem, I have to explain maybe a little bit. It's dedicated to my grandfather who's since passed away. Uh, and it's called Priam. When I, say, when I say Priam, does anybody know the character of Priam? So um, one of the strangest, and most horrifying stories of my family is that my uncle Peter died in a motorcycle accident when he was 19. And my grandfather had to go to the accident site and find his son there. And my grandfather was never really able to talk to me about this. How could anybody really talk about this? And my father was never really able to talk about this because he was too young and he probably wouldn't have talked to me about it anyways, honestly. And all I could ever think of was in the Iliad, the great king Priam, king of Troy, comes and has to beg Achilles for his son's body back. Achilles has killed Hector. He's dragged the body all around Troy. He's keeping it in his tent day and night. And Priam has to walk out into the battlefield and literally beg for his son's body. Can you imagine begging the man who killed your son for the body of your son? I can't, but I thought if anybody could understand just a tiny bit, maybe it was my grandfather. And so I wrote this. It called Priam. If you watched him clip his suspenders, you'd understand how the left pinky knots and bends like the base of a juniper. He grazes the tin clasp again and again until some brief connection of metal to cloth. And there's no mirror or the papery fingers of his wife, just time and breath and breath, waiting for each tide to recoil against black ships to touch one more time the long line of his son's cheekbone, to see if his beard still grows despite the cold like scrub and sagebrush. If you lost a son in traffic, you'd understand. Slow motion, falling metal, the dirt cake wheel and fork that welded to the side of a truck, <coughs> how it buckled like tent posts, or worn hulls or copper fasteners reaching out from each board like buttons, riding breath, riding waves of salt water and rhythm against sand and seam until clamps shut like the fists of some boy king painted with his son's blood. If you watched him, you'd understand that it's not in spite, but because of this, that he kissed the driver's hands who had dragged him for blood. Um, this next piece, again, maybe just needs a little bit of introduction. Um, anybody know the character of Sarpedon? I heard that name before. So Sarpedon is a super interesting character in the Iliad. He's a son of Zeus. And most of the sons of Zeus that we know have like super awesome powers. Right? Hercules is a son of Zeus. Um, we were like, oh, they're going to have great strength. They're going to perform labors. Uh, Sarpedon doesn't have any power. Uh, at all. He's just a person. Um, but one of the great tragedies of the Iliad is that Zeus can't prevent his death. It's fated. We know it's going to happen. There's nothing that could be done about it. So even Zeus, fucking Zeus, can't save his own son in this particular case. Um, for whatever reason, I'm haunted by this particular story, and I used it as a way to try to talk about my grandmother's passing. She passed quite a while ago. Um, and this poem starts with a quote from Heraclitus, which is, gods live past our meager death, but we, we die past their ceaseless living. Sarpedon. Sarpedon, dead on the battlefield, is swept away by sleep and death. Of course he is. Of course we all are. Some things even the gods can't change. Sometimes it's a sound only heard by nervous horses, the scraping of skin, linen soaked in resin and naphtha, 
dressing wounds that are right below the rib cage. And sometimes it's a thundercloud, far off, but speaking in rolling tones, but providing no rain. Sometimes it's gray, like Sarpedon's Irides, or the small box that my grandmother's ashes now reside in. Fire tonight is as likely as rain, and the hymnal left on this pew is somehow missing its first four pages. Birth date, unknown. Typed in bold black letters along the side of the box, but date of death, certain that flowers will overshadow the scene. Meager, limp hands embrace in an act that resembles sorrow, but does not claim it. Like a body left in a field, taken by two gods, who do not speak to one another or acknowledge that they are brothers by blood. There is always blood, and so no reminder is necessary. Their bandages are nothing more than symbol or gesture, the violet bathrobe that was placed gently beneath my grandmother's head, thrown away or burned with the rest of this prairie field, an act of such cruel necessity, even the rain must yield. All right, I'm going to switch. The worst moment is trying to switch from one book to the other because then you have the awkward moment where you're like, I'm going to read from another book. Um, second book happened fairly quickly after the first book. I actually wrote them both at the same time, but focused heavily on this one. When I was done with all of this, I finally got to come back and finish this one uh, and was lucky enough to have it picked up fairly quickly. Uh, this book deals with a lot of the same themes, but really, if I could give it to you in one sentence, it's examining the interaction of faith and science at the point of loss. So when we lose something very, very, very important, I think we either go to faith or we go to science. How can I explain this? How can I explain this away? So that was definitely, that's how it is for me, at least. So that was the thing that I was thinking about. Um, I'll start out with this poem called The Body, which also is being considered of my grandfather. This is a little later uh, in my grandfather's life before he passed away. The body. Sometimes you put it aside, the body, I mean. Sometimes ignore the way you stumble through a grove of trees. But that's a lie. There are no trees here, no giant sequoia, no unglaciated ridges or valleys. I often lie to you. I've often said I understood what you've offered to a conversation. I've nodded in agreement. But really, I've heard nothing. And this reminds me most of wind. I wish I could tell you why. Maybe it's all better that way as wind. Maybe I'm a sail, or maybe I'm just its luff, or maybe I'm nothing at all. What I mean to say is that I'm most like my grandfather, who fell in the shower yesterday in the home he's forced to live in, and pulled the cord that lines the floor of every room in that sort of home. And of course they tell us he'll be fine. Fine is what they say. And he tells us nothing at all, because perhaps there is nothing to tell. Perhaps there's nothing but wind. And that's why it's all he can ever hear. I want to read a couple of poems from the center section of this book. So the center section of this book tries to write a poem for every letter in the Greek alphabet which we were previously talking about. Uh, and it really examines the dissolution of a relationship between two people. So that's probably the best way I can introduce it. Um, all of the scientific, mathematical, natural sciences, everything that's in these poems that is being referenced are all related to the letter as a variable in an equation, in a particular concept. So. The idea for the poem is not necessarily to understand every concept, but to hope that there might be some kernel of understanding in the same way that the speaker is hoping to grab onto something to understand. So the first one is Yoda. What if silence was the smallest unit of measure for distance between two people? An imaginary number, a defining equation with two distinct solutions, equally valid. What if, what if I began the poem again, started this time with quiet instead? 
What if quiet was the smallest unit of measure for distance between a man and a woman sitting together at the edge of an unfinished bench, the edge of this world, wanting for nothing? But no, you and your uniqueness quantification, you and your there is one and only one. I get the logic, I understand. To prove the existence of a particular thing, A, with all its desire and desire count qualities, you assume the existence of another thing, B, and you deduce their quality. It's simple. Start with the transitive property, pass over these things, and, of course, with cancellation, always an inevitable sum, unmistakable equality. Proof that's held in the backyard's topological space where two continuous functions won't speak to one another. Not when there's so much to see, dashed line of a fence, just enough space to bury any number of things. Omicron. We don't talk about it, but there's an order of operations to leaving. Calculate, divide, deal with the variables. Taping the bottom of each box before the top, for example. Of course. Of course it's all just random what side we choose. It's just where we decide to make our mark. We're foolish, you and I, and we do foolish things. When he told me about him, foolish him, I could only respond in the vocative. Oh. Oh. Oh, Micron. Omega. The smallest of things and the largest. The furthest star in any constellation is still brighter than anything you've ever imagined, but is only punctuation to the sky. Giant, fiery, and ancient punctuation. Eventually, Perhaps inevitably, we arbitrarily approach the limit of this function. We can try to find where there's still growth if and only if there exist positive numbers. But we both know the argument is tending towards infinity. All simpler sum functions seem spent. Sufficiently large, suitably close, it seems, once again, we're left with X. I have one more poem for you. I just want to read one from the new project. Um, when I was a younger writer, we used to have writers come in, well, like say when I was in school, and I'd always be like, why do they only read the new stuff? Read the book, I love the book, I want to hear from the book. I realized later it's because these books are generally many years past and you really want to read the new thing you're working on. So I'm just gonna read one. Um, basically the new book is an exploration of the soundscapes of the American West. So I've been going to lots of places in the West and I'm recording sound and then I'm responding to that. This particular poem uh, is in Kurdistan, Hawaii, uh, where we just was during a volcano, which was intense, let's be honest. Um, a little bit about the poem before I do it. Um, it works in columns. So when you look at the poem, you can read it down or you can read it across. So what I'm going to do is read it down and then read the second column and then read the whole thing for you. Um, okay. So this is called Chorus, Curtis Town, Hawaii. Frog or fog or the brief motion that begs a log from some fallen tree. Like Sunday's terse mass. Think about it. Stitch our sails while barn cats prowl in pronation. I haven't the heart to tell you. The one made of lahua and rain. A marriage proposal, just like Nene in the night sky, soft. Though it doesn't matter. There are seeds from a broken house mouse. Ohia grows everywhere that's just cooled. Listen to that lays glow night like ash breath hue, leading me back home to you. Not to be crass, but it rains more in the past. Here we sit, and there are all kinds of song, the one where a trysted tree follows Daphne's fall. Imagine, 
call, graze, or browse, and the shrubs, shouts left sorted by the door, nothing more. You say, even lava, it sounds like hip, click, cokey call, leading me back home to you. Frog or fog or the brief motion that begs a log from some fallen tree, not to be crass like Sunday's terse mass, but it rains more in the past. Think about it. Here we sit and stitch our sails while barn cats prowl in pronation. There are all kinds of song. I haven't the heart to tell you. The one made of lahua and rain, the one where a twisted tree follows a marriage proposal, just like Daphne's fall. Imagine Nene in the night sky, soft call, graze or browse, though it doesn't matter. There are seeds in the shrubs, shouts from a broken house mouse left sorted by the door, nothing more. Ohia grows everywhere, you say. Even lava that's just cooled. Listen to that blaze glow night. It sounds like ash breath hue, like hip click cokey call, leading me back home to you. Thank you. thing or have you found that you're running out of like mythical creatures? In it's a good question. No, I um, I feel like I've come back to it. I feel like it was where I was living for such a long time and then I was like I have to do something else mm -hmm. and then you realize that there's just so many more stories and I guess I didn't even realize that. Right and, and you can always bring other friends in. in Absolutely. Place. You use them. Absolutely. It's like um, isn't that like C.S. Lewis in, in uh, what is it, J.K., whatever it is. Like in Lion, which right. wardrobe and things no, like that? No, but, but the guy that did, uh, the, the freaking J.R.R. Tolkien, they had that little dynamic with the, with the uh, mythology and stuff like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah, and they did it right. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Anything else, anybody? Wow, I thought that was so wonderful. You're inspiring me. And since I just recently was reading about Nene, Nene is the state bird of Hawaii. Those of you who do crossword puzzles should know that. But <laughs> you know, or if you've been to Hawaii, you would know. But and I'm I'm trying to imagine the sound of a Nene in the sky now. I'm like, oh wait. I didn't mean, predict that. That wasn't in the right spot apparently. Honestly the best part is they have signs that have a Nene on them that says Nene crossing. Oh, <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> and it's the cutest continuous.